Well, let's begin with the day's market action. Well, a late surge helped the Nifty as well as the Sensex end another range-bound session. Close to half a percent in the green. Banks led from the front with the Nifty Bank ending the day at a record close. That index ended above the 42,200 mark for the first time ever. Mid-caps underperformed the benchmarks with the index ending the day flat. Meanwhile, the slowdown in global growth has taken a toll on India's exports in October, with exports dropping below $30 billion. Trade deficit has widened to $27 billion. Lata Venkatesh is joining us now with more details. Lata. Uh, the biggest takeaway from the October trade deficit numbers is the drop in exports. At 29 billion, it's about 6 billion lower than what it was a year ago, what it was a month ago, and what is worse, it is the lowest export number we have had in 20 months. The last time we had below 30 billion was way back in February 2021. Uh, now, imports have also gone down to 56.5 billion from a high of uh, about 60 billion in August and July. But uh, the of a fall is not enough. It still leaves a trade deficit of nearly $27 billion, $26.7 billion, and uh, that's a little unsupportable. The uh, trade deficit, if you... Uh, the, the small fall that we see in trade deficit from about $30 billion in the last two months to $26 billion is only because of the fall in crude prices, and uh, uh, that means that it is still unsustainable. If you add the surplus that we make in services, after all, we are a, a, you know, a software exporting giant. If we add that surplus, then the October, April-October trade deficit is 98 billion. By itself, the goods deficit in seven months is 173 billion. Taking the surplus, the deficit falls to 98 billion dollars. But if you extrapolate at the same level for the next five months, you will get a uh, trade deficit of 170 billion. And that will mean that we can end up with a current account deficit of uh, almost 3.5% uh, of GDP. That's the big worry. And we did see a small fall in the rupee after the numbers were announced. Well, speaking of global concerns, government officials believe that they will be approaching the fiscal roadmap with a sense of caution in FY24 amidst an uncertain global environment. Sapna Das uh, joins us now with more details. Uh, Sapna, tell us, what are you picking up? Indeed, what we are given to understand is that FR24, uh, the government may have actually approach the new financial year with a bit of caution, uh, especially as far as the fiscal management is concerned. And I think the primary concern on that front would be trying to stick to the fiscal glide path. Uh, they have a glide path of, uh, uh, you know, a fiscal deficit of under 4.5% by FR26. In case there's even a minor slippage in the current financial year on FT, uh, then that glide path becomes all the more challenging. I suppose that's one of the concerns, and they're trying to make all efforts to make sure that 6.4% is not reached. At least that's the view as of now. Of course, uh, you know, the global uncertainty is going to be a key, will continue to be a key challenge for the government, not just in terms of the fisc and the budget and all of that, but mainly in terms of the trade deficit numbers, the export numbers, the overall growth prospects. So uh, there are enough headwinds at the moment globally, and I think that's what is going to be a challenge for them in the coming year, hence this note of caution that is being, uh, you know, that is being indicated. Last but not the least, in terms of additional expenditure coming in, well, the supplementary demands for grants will come up in the winter session of parliament. Additional uh, demands on food and fertilizer subsidy need to be met. But here again, the government's view is very clear that all that money will only be released depending on the spending capacity of the ministries. So that's an indication that maybe all of that amount is not going to come in at one stroke. Last but not the least, the government is not looking at any additional borrowing uh, in the in the current uh, financial year. Uh, if need be, they will rely on the National Small Savings Fund, as they've always done in terms of deficit financing. Right, Sapna, thanks a lot for that. Now, even as the fiscal roadmap looks challenging, tax mop-up remains robust. Here is the CBDT chief on the collections. As of now, we are uh, up 24 percent uh, already vis-a-vis -vis the last year and uh, in net terms after issuing refunds of around 2 lakh of crores of rupees uh, which was around 1 lakh 10,000 crore last year in the corresponding period. On the gross basis also our collections are 30 percent uh, higher than the last year. So we are very hopeful that we would be achieving around 25 percent growth in the net collections over and above the budget estimates and that will be a, a very positive development for the entire economy and for the development of our country. Home Minister Amit Shah says that the Indian economy has seen a V-shaped recovery 
Speaking exclusively to Network 18, Home Minister said that the government has a roadmap to tackle inflation. जहाँ तक महंगाई का सवाल है, पहले कोरोना के कारण और बाद में रूसिया और यूक्रेन के युद्ध के कारण पूरे विश्व की सप्लाई चेन में बिखराव है और एक वैश्विक समस्या है जिसका असर कम मात्रा में भारत पर भी पड़ा है। मगर मैं देश की जनता को, गुजरात की जनता को सुनिश्चित करना चाहता हूँ कि टेम्पररी फेज है। नरेंद्र मोदी सरकार ने बहुत अच्छे तरीके से इसकी रणनीति भी बनाई है और दुनिया में कोरोना के बाद मंदी से सबसे तेजी से उभरने वाले देशों में से एक देश भारत है हमारी अर्थव्यवस्था वी सेप में रिकवर करी है और अब इस पर भी काफी अच्छा असर पड़ेगा शायद रसिया यूक्रेन युद्ध न होता तो अब तक तो हम बाहर भी आ गए होंगे Well, after missing the date with Diwali, the government hopes to seal the free trade deal with the United Kingdom by March next year. Abhimanyu Sharma is joining us now with more details. Abhimanyu, tell us, what is the latest that you're picking up? Government sources have indicated that the internal deadline for the proposed India-UK FTA is March 2023. However, the deadline will be of value if at all the chief negotiators from both the sides do reach a settlement based on a give-and-take arrangement as part of the discussions. Already 26 chapters were discussed threadbare before a lot of political developments had taken place in the United Kingdom. Sources have indicated that Indian government will have to look into the issues pertaining to IPR and it cannot allow evergreening as India is into generic medicine. A lot of analytics are involved behind the offers given as far as not just this FTA but other proposed FTAs are concerned. The trade deal with Australia has already been placed before their parliament and may get ratified by December. Also, sources have indicated that the third round of India-EU FTA talks are scheduled in India from the 28th of November to the 9th of December of which 75 sessions on 19 policy areas are scheduled in this round. The India-Canada CPAS fifth round is slated from the 14th November to the 18th of November and apart from the usual areas, the trade deal is bound to cover areas like SMEs, trade and gender, labour and environment. It remains to be seen how early developments will take place in various FTA talks which have been initiated between India and several other countries. Thanks a lot for that, Avimanyu. Now, the 17th G20 summit has kicked off in Indonesia's Bali. The big focus so far has uh, been the meeting between American President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping. The meeting could set the tone for improved U.S.-China relationship in the days to come. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, meanwhile, has reiterated his call for peace and held several bilateral meetings on the sidelines, including one with U.S. President Joe Biden. Here's a wrap of all the action from day one. Competition should not turn into conflict. That was President Biden's key message to Chinese President Xi Jinping at the G20 summit in Bali, the first in-person meeting of the two leaders. I mean, we had an open and candid conversation about our intentions and our priorities. It was clear, he was clear and I was clear, that we'll defend American interests and values, promote universal human rights, and stand up for the international order and work in lockstep with our allies and partners. We're going to compete vigorously, but I'm not looking for conflict. I'm looking to manage this competition responsibly. Both leaders discussed the Ukraine-Russia war and agreed that any threat or use of nuclear weapons was totally unacceptable. While Biden raised objections to China's coercive and aggressive actions over Taiwan, the Chinese side conveyed that the Taiwan question was an internal matter and a red line that should not be crossed in US-China relations. The Chinese Foreign Ministry also said the world was big enough for US and China to develop and prosper. Tensions over the Ukraine-Russia war and its severe economic fallout is clearly weighing on every leader's mind at the G20. Addressing leaders virtually, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said that it was time for Russia's war to end. He also requested for an extension of the Black Sea grain deal. At the summit, Prime Minister Narendra Modi met President Joe Biden, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, President Emmanuel Macron and President Mark Rutte of Netherlands. PM Modi called for an immediate ceasefire in Ukraine and warned about the consequences of the fertilizer shortage that the world is currently facing.
Prime Minister Modi said at G20, and I quote, I have repeatedly said that we have to find a way to return to the path of ceasefire and diplomacy in Ukraine. I am confident that next year, when G20 meets in the holy land of Buddha and Gandhi, we will convey a strong message of peace. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has a five-point agenda at the G20, which includes ending Putin's weaponization of food and energy. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said, and I quote, It is notable that Putin didn't feel able to join us here. Maybe if he had, we could get on with sorting things out. Because the single biggest difference that anyone could make is for Russia to get out of Ukraine and end this war. End of quote. There is still a question mark on whether the G20 will be able to arrive at a joint declaration due to lack of consensus on whether to condemn Russia and President Putin for the war against Ukraine. In New Delhi, Parikshit Lutra. Well, back home, Gautam Adani-led Adani Group has received SEBI's approval to float an open offer to acquire a further 26% stake in NDTV. The Adani Group already owns 29% in the media house. The open offer will commence on the 22nd of November. Meanwhile, global retail giant Walmart delivered a strong third quarter. Its revenue jumped nearly 9% year-on-year to more than $150 billion due to buoyant grocery sales. However, it recorded a net loss of $1.8 billion. But that did not deter investors as Walmart shares rallied in trade. That's because the company has raised its profit forecast for 2023. Meanwhile, the big tech austerity drive is set to continue after Meta. Amazon is set to lay off 10,000 employees. Shilpa Rani Petta is joining us with more. 11,000 at Meta, 10,000 likely at Amazon, 6,000 at Snap, nearly 4,000 at Twitter, about 1,000 each at Microsoft and Salesforce. These are just some of the big layoff numbers that have come in over the last couple of weeks. The human resource downsizing began a year or so ago with mortgage lender Better letting go of over 3,000 people across multiple rounds. It has now extended to big tech, once considered the safe haven of job security. Now, according to job tech platform TrueUp's tech layoff tracker, over 183,000 people have been handed the pink slips so far in 2022, and analysts say that we may not be at the end of the jobs cut cycle. How did we get here, though? The simple explanation excessive hiring fueled by optimism that the shift to tech solutions in the wake of the pandemic would not get reversed or slow down. Now, tech companies are known to hire in droves, but with people now returning outdoor, going back to offices and doing more things offline, engagement on these tech platforms has been dropping steadily. Now, this has resulted in revenue growth taking a hit and is cannonballed into a fall in valuations. Then came Russia's invasion of Ukraine, heightened inflation, rising interest rates, and companies across the board were hit for a loop by these stocks. Now, tech leaders have since gone on record blaming these shocks for drastic measures that they have had to take. This is from Twitter's founder Jack Dorsey saying, we grew the company too quickly, to Meta co-founder Mark Zuckerberg saying, this did not play out the way we expected, to even Stripe co-founder and CEO Patrick Collison saying, we over hired for a world that we're in. Now, companies are being forced to cut costs, prioritize growth and increase efficiency as companies rework and realign their priorities and freezing hires and job uh, cuts uh, will cannot be ruled out. Right, uh, Shilpa, thanks a lot for that. Now, there's also been a churn at the Meta India top deck. Abhijit Bose has resigned as WhatsApp India head. Rajiv Agarwal has resigned as the public policy director of Meta India. Meanwhile, Shivnath Thukral has been appointed as the new director for public policy at Meta India. Meta, in a statement, said that the resignations are completely unrelated to the recent news cycles, indicating that they should not be seen along the recent layoffs. Now, in court action, the Gujarat High Court came down heavily on the Morbi civic body after no representatives turned up at a PIL hearing, this despite a court notice being issued. Now, the Morbi Bridge collapsed uh, last month and killed over 140 people. The court also questioned the manner in which the contract was awarded for repair and maintenance of the bridge.
Meanwhile, the Supreme Court reserved its judgment on a plea seeking additional restrictions on free speech for MPs, MLAs, as well as ministers to discourage them from indulging in hate speech. The centre argued against a five-judge bench hearing the matter, claiming that the court had already prescribed detailed guidelines on hate speech.